But it's one of, one of the perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. was talking yeah. about yeah. racism yeah. and how yeah. they grew up being racist and you know and, and uh, how things have just changed in their life. It's, it's not particularly from a Christian point of view. It's just yeah. We'll we'll never we'll never get sin is the cause of racism. Yes. Sin is the cause of racism. I mean, sin the wisdom. So no matter how bad we want to remove racism, no matter how bad we labor and toil to establish all these different rules and laws to try to do away with racism, all those rules and laws we try to establish, not only can they never do away with racism, but they'll create more racism. Because racism is the fruit of us trying to be justified through our flesh or knowing ourselves according to our flesh, knowing ourselves by our skin color, knowing ourselves by our sex, all those kinds of things. And the more we implement a thinking that causes us to know ourselves by those things more and more and more, the more division will cause amongst people. Because we'll see each other as different, right? And not only will we see each other as different, we'll judge each other by our differences Mm -hmm. and we'll attribute our pain and suffering to the people we see different than us. We'll scapegoat the other people. Now that creates hatred for those people is what happens. Mm-hmm. And, and typically what society does is we implement rules and regulations that convinces one group of people that another group of people is the source of their suffering. Well, what do you think that puts in, in their hearts towards the other people? Hatred, mm-hmm. right? right? More division, mm-hmm. more division. Where God come and said, listen, the thing that's causing suffering is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has been planted in the earth and people are all the time eating from it. It's not other people causing your suffering. It's this tree causing your suffering, right? And that's why Jesus said, I come to take the ax to the root of the tree. He come to, you know, like at Christmas, you go and cut down a tree out in the woods or whatever, and you carry drag it. Jesus came like a Christmas guy looking for a tree, except he wasn't looking to take this tree to his house. He was looking to cut that thing down and then burn it up, right? And he did. That's right. Third law comes to knowledge of sin. So what happens is we think that if we set these laws up and to, to tell people how they should behave toward one another, it'll be good. But the law itself draws lines and distinctions. You are this and you are this, but we got to get together. But when you draw the distinctions, you immediately bring down the people between people. Yeah, and, and listen, this isn't a vote for a candidate or a ideology in our country when I say this, but I'm just pointing this out. And it, it, it's not to give the guy affirmation to everything he says or does, but this one thing that the guy said in the, in, in the I don't know what they call it, is it the inauguration speech? Mm-hmm. But he made a comment about how we're all Americans and we all bleed blood. You see, and I don't know if he realizes what that was born from, but it was basically the wisdom that, There's no difference between any of us. We're all the same. That's actually the thing that possesses the power to destroy racism. You see, and if if we could stop knowing ourselves by the color of our skin or by our sex as far as our value and worth or as far as our life, then that would do a lot to do away with a lot of the suffering in the earth. Right? It's like if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Well, the wisdom of man is if if I've suffered injustice in this world, or if injustice is coming against me in this world, I'm going to pick up the sword and I'm going to fight it. Mm-hmm. But when Peter picked up the sword to fight the injustice that was coming against Jesus, and he cut off the guy's ear, what did Jesus do? He told him, put the sword up, man. And he healed the guy's ear. And he healed the guy's ear, right? Is it for me? And the way, that, the way that we fight injustice, guys, is in the hearts of people. Jesus said the kingdom of God is found within, not without. We're so busy trying to clean up the fruit on the outside of the tree that we're leaving the root that creates the fruit firmly planted. So I can go out there and pick all the fruit off all I like. I can feel real good. Tomorrow morning, it's all going to be there again. And I'm going to wonder, what's going on? But if we can speak a word to people about how they were crucified with Christ and they no longer see themselves after the flesh, they don't know themselves after the flesh, they'll be set free from that and we'll stop looking at each other after the flesh and we'll start looking at each other after the spirit and then we'll have discern something called discerning of spirits well we'll see there's a spirit in the earth that has brought injustice to all people and not only has it brought injustice to all people it comes to convince the people that other people are responsible for the injustice they've experienced and then it gets fighting going on back and forth but what jesus said is that justice is not found In the world. See, Jesus had something in him. We all agree, Jesus had the most injustice come against him than any one single human being ever had. But, so, 
why is it that Jesus didn't fight for his rights? Why didn't Jesus take up the sword? Why wasn't Jesus out there preaching about what he deserved? You see, Jesus, he didn't do that by his own works, but Jesus had a wisdom that said justice from the injustice of the world can never be found from the world. That which brings you injustice, the world, can't be that which saves you from the injustice. Mm. Right? So the, the wicked trick the devil's got going on is that the wisdom of the world is what brings injustice to us. And now he's got us looking to the world to be saved from. It. And so it, fo- it fosters this cycle of nothing but more and more injustice. So Jesus looked and he said, freedom from this injustice that's coming against me isn't found in the world. It's not found from the world nor can the world even give it to me if it wants to. Freedom from the injustice in the world is found in Abba, in the word of what Abba has spoken about me and my life, in the word of what Abba will do to bring justice to me. Right? That caused him to rest. And he experienced freedom from the great injustice that came against him. How do we know? Because when he was hanging on the cross, absorbing the injustice of the world, he felt rest instead of laboring and toiling. He talked to God instead of enlisting his own ability. Now, if Jesus would have tried to save himself from the injustice that came against him in the world, do you know what that would have looked like? Him coming off the cross, growing about eight feet and smiting all those people. (laughs) That's the world's idea of justice. Exactly right. You see? But Jesus experienced freedom from that. He experienced a peace and a rest in the midst of the injustices of the world coming against him. Because he knew, I can't find justice in the world. So he didn't look there. He said, I can only find justice from God. In God. Right? And so then he starts talking with God. Abba. He engages God. He becomes encouraged in the truth. The Spirit comes and ministers to his heart. Right? And then he finds justice from the injustice that was happening to him in his heart. Because he was set free from the effects that that injustice was trying to have upon his life. He was set free from it. We, we only look at the outward effect of injustice or the outward action of injustice. We never consider the effect it has inside of the heart. The most powerful injustice isn't what can happen to you outwardly. It's what it will happen to you inwardly after the outward thing happens to you. Right? And so freedom from injustice comes from your heart being protected from the effects of injustice. Right? And so Jesus, injustice is coming against him. And Jesus was set free from the effect that had on his heart. He wasn't filled with angry retribution as he hung on the cross. He wasn't filled with vengeance. Towards people. He wasn't filled with how he's going to exalt himself. He wasn't filled with laboring and toiling about how he was going to get himself justice. He experienced peace and rest. Listen, if your mind is filled with trying to bring justice, you're not in rest. You're not filled with peace. You're filled with labors and annoyances. That's what you're filled with. And that's the worst effect that injustice can have on you. Because every human being has something deep in their heart that tells them they're full of value and worth. Every human being has a silent voice that echoes in them that they're the God kind. That they're created for glory. That they're created for life. That their life has value and worth. And so when something in this world comes against that idea, they feel great pain. And they're being tempted to prove it or to look to Abba. Right? And if you take on the idea that you're now going to establish justice by what you bring forth, or that you're going to bring justice, you're filled with laboring and toiling, anger, hatred, envying, backbiting, gossip, all those different kinds of things. That's the worst effect of injustice. Right? That's the worst effect of injustice, is that it will fill your conscience with laboring and toiling to justify yourself. It'll fill your conscience with laboring and toiling to bring about justice. 
Instead of resting in the word of what God did to bring justice. God's already brought justice to all of us. The injustice we've all been experiencing is at the hands of the death that entered the world. The sin and the death that came by Adam. And so what did God do? God came and made that thing right. He brought justice. How did he bring justice? He took a human being who was in bondage to the injustice of the world. And he raised that human being up. And he sat that human being at the right hand of God. Clothed him in glory and eternal life. He brought justice. And now we can see the justice that God has brought to us. And we can find that justice strengthening us in the inner man. And then I no longer care about what another human being can say or do to me. Because I'm not looking for justice there. Should another person think that white people are the cause of the evil in the earth? And they come against me? I don't care. Because God has brought me justice. I don't need it from them. Should... Uh, I mean, it's like the worst thing in the world right now in the political correctness environment to be a, a, a white male. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I, guess I, have, I mean, I guess I have some Indian too, but it don't look like it, so yeah. that won't count. But like, so should the world adopt this persuasion that it's white men that have ruined everything? Listen, man, I'm not going to be fighting to prove that white men are good. Do you see what I'm saying? Because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter what they say. Right. We're never going to get the world to agree with what God has said about us. We're never going to find justice from the world. That's the trick of the Adam man. The Adam man is always laboring and toiling to establish justice for themselves. Right? The Christ man sees that God will bring justice. And he rests in the justice God has brought through his son. Right? So when the Bible talks about do justice in the earth, you know what you do justice in the earth is by preaching what God has done in Christ. You preach Christ and Him crucified. You're bringing justice to the pain and suffering that's come against people's hearts. That's the greatest injustice that could happen to a being that was created only for love and peace and joy and kindness and patience and meekness and faithfulness towards God. The greatest injustice that can happen to that human being is their hearts filled with anger and envy and backbiting and gossiping and striving and laboring and toiling. So if I want to bring justice to them, I want to set their heart free from that laboring and toiling. How am I going to do that? I'm going to preach Christ and Him crucified in the earth and that will bring justice. But the carnal mind says, no, I'll bring justice by what I do. The mind of Christ says, I'll bring justice by resting in the Father. And his life will manifest out of me and I will preach his word. Right? I mean, Jesus is the word made flesh. That, that, that thing that was made flesh and him hanging on the cross, it, it was speaking a word. It was echoing a word in the earth. Right? Yeah. It was echoing a word in the earth. What was it saying to us? Was it the centurions that were brought injustice to Jesus? Was it the Jewish people that brought injustice to Jesus? Jesus didn't see it that way. He saw it as death. He saw it as sin that was bringing him injustice. Right? Yeah. And that's why he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, there's a word being made flesh there. Let us see what brings injustice. If we can see what brings injustice, then we can be like Jesus, and we can preach a word that takes an ax to the root. Right? Instead of picking the fruit off the tree. And then coming back out and saying, oh my gosh, the fruit's all there still, man. <laughs> That's right. Listen, man's been laboring and toiling for like 6,000 years trying to get it right. Trying to bring about eternal life in the earth. Where are we at? Mm-hmm. How long will be a long enough period of sample time? Is 6,000 years a long enough sample time? Or do we think now we're smarter than the guys 6,000 years ago and so now through our great intellect? That's kind of like our disposition, isn't it? No? God didn't come down and say, listen, if we can just, if we can just fix all the fruit here, then you can have eternal life. No, no, no. God come down and said, the world can't give you eternal life. Stop looking there for it. Oh, that's right. freedom from the injustice of the world. That's what freedom from the world actually is. Mm-hmm. That even should the world bring you injustice, you experience a life that overcomes injustice. Even in the face of injustice, you experience a life in the inner person that overcomes the effect that injustice tries to have on the heart. Because you won't labor to justify yourself. You won't be filled with envy, lack, backbiting, gossip, hatred. I think injustice is one of those triggers for most people, though, that really just sets you off to go do something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It really does. I mean, you can deal with a lot of other things and go, yeah, okay, that, 
but injustice, if, especially if it's against you, just it's like an almost an automatic response to set you off. Mm-hmm. And why though? Just, why? Because we're not designed to deal with that. Right. And so the serpent knows that. Yes. Listen, that doesn't mean I'm not going to protect my wife if somebody comes to the house trying to take out my wife. So please understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that if somebody tries to take out the country, that somehow it's evil to protect the country. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay, so please understand what I'm saying. Right? Yeah. I'm talking about all the stuff going on in the world now where we're trying to define each other by what sex and what color we are mm-hmm. and who's gotten better than, than somebody else. You know, one of the big things that said that would happen to the woman in the earth, that her desire would be unto the man. God said, because you've done this, your desire will now be unto the man. Now, he's talking about a couple of things there. One of the things is that the woman would seek to be justified by the approval of the man. Mm. They would seek to find the evidence that they are as they ought to be by the approval of a man. Right? Yeah. They can only find that from God. But another thing that God's talking about there, you're going to seek to find the evidence that you have equality by you being the same as the man. Women and men don't have equality by them being able to do the same things. That's not where equality is found. Do you see? But the mind that was going to come to the woman was that they were going to look at the differences between the man and the woman, and they were going to say that in order to have equality, I've got to do the same things a man does. Or I've got to prove I can do the same. Do you see? I've got to prove. And so now you see that whole, this is how women have been attacked in the earth. Right? No, no, your equality is not found in doing things like the man. That's why you're a woman. And the man doesn't find equality by being able to do the things you can do. That's why you come together as one. You come together as one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The father sent the son. The father wasn't like, well, I wasn't the son dying on the cross. He's better than me, by golly. <laughs> he didn't say, well, I can do that too. No. <laughs> he didn't say, let me prove that I've done it. Right? The spirit wasn't like, I want to do that, man. The people are going to like him more than me. The people are going to think more about Jesus than me. The people are going to think Jesus is stronger than me. I got to go and do that, Father. See, they didn't have that mind. They saw themselves as one. And so they saw us. Not different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But the world, you see the, the way the world tries to bring about equality. Right? Equality is something that's born in your heart from hearing the word God has spoken over your life in Christ. That's the only thing that can bring it. You were designed for your life to be born from that, not a life of striving to prove. The moment you're caught in a trap of striving to prove, you've eaten from the tree. You've eaten from the tree. And that's the curse of the Adam man. That's what it talks about when it says the curse of the law, the curse that's revealed by the law. A cursed life. What did, what did God say to Adam? Because you've done this, your life is cursed. And then he describes it as living by the sweat of your brow, where you're laboring and toiling all your days to bring about good fruit, but never bringing about good fruit, right. only bringing about thorns and thistles. Mm-hmm. Right? So guys, if we feel frustrated by injustice, that's normal. It's normal. But what do we do with it when it comes? And it's one of the greatest temptations that can come to man because we were created with something that says we're full of glory and honor and value and worth. We're actually created to be seated at the right hand of God. We all have an echo in our heart of that, right? Now, if something comes against us that seemingly contradicts that, it's going to bring forth a cry in our hearts to want the truth to be revealed, right? That's normal too. John said it this way, the world has not acknowledged us for who and what we are. But we know this, that when he comes, we'll see him and we'll see we're the same as him. Right? And so, guys, the world is not going to ever acknowledge the beauty that God has acknowledged in us. It's never going to acknowledge the glory and honor God's ascribed to us. Never. And it's meant with the intent to cause us to strive and labor and toil to try to get the world to acknowledge that's the cursed life. <laughs> right? That's the cursed life. Is it wrong to want to be respected? Is it wrong that's to... Trigger, that's a trigger thing. Is that you disrespected me. Boom. You know? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Is it wrong to want to desire to be respected? I mean, the, 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 the difference comes down in the terminology. There's a difference between desire and deserve. Living by desire. Of course it's okay to desire for people to show you respect. You were created from the foundation of God getting down on one knee and bowing his head to you. 
So, of course, you were created to desire respect. And if you don't think you're getting it, it can be very frustrating and you can desire to want respect. But listen, the God life isn't a life where you're walking around all the time frustrated because you think people aren't respecting you. That's not the God life. The God life is where even should people disrespect you because guess what? They will. (laughs) They will. Now, do you want your life to be shaped by their disrespecting you? Or do you want your life to be shaped by the word God spoken over you? Right? And so absolutely, there's nothing wrong with desiring to be respected. We all have a yearning for the world and for people to acknowledge the beauty we know is in us. Paul said the, the, all of creation groans in travail. And we groan in travail too, desiring to be seen and acknowledged for who and what we are. And so the groaning is normal. The question is, what are you going to do when you feel that groaning? Are you going to start talking with God about the frustration it's causing you? About the pain it's causing you? About the anger it's causing you? Don't they see God? I mean, Listen, I have conversations with God like that all the time. And so the groaning is normal. How are you going to process the groaning? Right? Are you going to talk with Abba about it and let him sort it out and remove it from your heart? Are you going to take the mantle up of that frustration? Right? <laughs> I will not be disrespected. Right. I remember uh, uh, a girl I dated a long time ago had a, a bad history with... Uh, her previous boyfriends and one of her her main sayings was I won't be disrespected (laughs) and you could just see that she had felt disrespected by the previous people and her whole life was born now from the foundation of she's not going to be disrespected (laughs) well listen if your life is born from that you'll find situations where you think people are disrespecting you where they ain't disrespecting you at all (laughs) right and it it shapes your life and it actually ruins it right it it actually causes you frustration that isn't there It's, it's a life of bondage where you're all the time in bondage. And so something that the God life will do in you is you don't look for respect from people. You'll just stop. And you won't stop because somebody told you it's the good and the right way. It won't because I'll give a TED talk that tell you you should stop looking for respect from people. Right? <laughs> right? It, it will just be from you hearing the voice of God so much, you'll, you'll, you'll see how much God's respect at you that you'll stop caring. Right? And it'll, you'll see it happening to you. It's not something you're going to work up. You'll just start to find yourself not caring so much if people don't acknowledge what God acknowledges or if people don't respect you all the time. Oh, so what? Right? What do I care? You'll actually command more respect that way than you'll ever get by trying to demand. Right? Yeah, you, demand, you try to demand respect. And ain't nobody going to respect you. That's the truth. I can tell you. I've seen it. That's right. But you'll command respect because if you, if you, if you don't get moved by people disrespecting you and you, te- and you treat a person with honor and dignity and respect, even in the face of their disrespect, that does something. You know what it does? It commands a respect in them towards you. And they don't even know why it happened. Right? The centurion who saw Jesus hanging there. And Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Abba, and to, truly that was a righteous man. Yeah. See how Jesus commanded respect? Even though he looked like the most disgraceful and shameful human that had ever lived, yeah. that had ever walked the face, forget about human, mm-hmm. creature. Yeah. I mean, he suffered more injustice than any creature. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I know that's a heavy topic, and there can be some nuances within there, but please understand what, I, I hope I said it, clear enough that people can understand what I'm trying to say there. I'm not saying that injustice is good or right. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is, how are we going to experience freedom from it in our hearts so our lives aren't shaped by it? Right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't want our lives to be shaped by it. It's bad enough if we're in a world where it can happen, but we don't want our lives to be shaped by it. So what's going to keep our lives from being shaped by it? Right? That's what we want to be busy with. So even should injustice come knocking on my door from time to time, or disrespect come knocking on my door from time to time, that thing doesn't have the power to reign over me. Right? right? right. Where I can just, yeah. <laughs> where the, I can feel a groaning, where I'm like, Lord, how long, man? Why don't they see? <clears throat> and then he'll sort through it. I know, man. Me too. 
I came to the earth. I came to the people I created. And I came to save them from their suffering. I came to save them from death because of how much I loved them and the beauty I beheld in them. And they nailed me to a tree. I didn't come to scold. I didn't come to hate. I didn't come to war against them. I came to embrace them and gather them to myself. And they hated me. And so when God, me too, man, I know the frustration you feel. It's okay. Right? And then you could start seeing. Right? It's like once you realize the world will never acknowledge you for the beauty that you are, what gradually starts happening is you stop looking there for the acknowledgement. Right? Then you're set free from trying to find it. Then you start walking through life and you notice the colors and such. <laughs> right? You, you start smelling the, the fresh air and you start seeing the water more clearly. Yeah. Because you're not walking around, you know, looking for respect or looking for the world to acknowledge the good you can do. You're not like that guy on Mad TV. Look at what I can do. <laughs> That's right. Right? That's right? And so then you're just doing it because you love it. And so, yeah, half the people you run across in the world may never acknowledge the good you did for them. You won't find joy from them acknowledging it. You'll find joy because you love it. Right? Yeah. I, have a, I have a question or a scenario. So when I was in Virginia, um, if we're kind of on the, how we see people by color, by race, and everything like that, I, was, I, uh, I ran across an individual that was racist. I and mean, he blatantly told me, said it. We were just kind of jokingly in a conversation. He's like, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm racist. And I kind of was just like, I was just in sh pure shock. I was like, wow, I've never, I guess maybe that was the first time I've actually heard somebody say it. This is, this is what I am. This is who I am. And I, and at first I was like, uh, all right, all right. And then, um, and I mean, Heather, Heather knew it. Cause I, I mean, I was like, man, I've been friends with this guy for like a month now. And then all of a sudden, boom, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. How do I, you know, it's like, if I go. And man, well, I don't really, I don't really, you know, approve that you feel this way about people and I'm just not going to, I'm going to almost befriend you. But I feel like if I do that, I'm literally doing the same thing he's doing. Yeah. So then it's, you know, it's not saying I'm, I've, I'm definitely not throwing it down his throat, you know, hey, it's wrong what you're doing. It's wrong. You're doing wrong because it's just going to create turmoil and he's just going to be like, well, I'm right and all this stuff like that. So I guess what, uh, and then every once in a while I kind of threw in my relationship with God and kind of just the love that he has and things like that. And then all of a sudden he'd be like, oh, you're the God guy. You're the God guy. I'm like, and I wasn't even trying to, to do it in a way that would make him change his mind. And I even asked him and I, cause I, every once in a while, like we, we did things. It was just me and him, like went out into the park and stuff like that. And every once in a while I just felt comfortable. I was like, why do you, why do you feel that way? Like, why do you believe that? He was, I don't know, man. I just kind of my grandfather was and I just grew up that way so it's like how do you I guess what I'm trying to get is not so much how do you change that person's mind to not feel that way but how do you not be almost the same way he is by you don't want to surround yourself because the people you surround yourself with the people you become so how do you want to help him to feel God's love and to feel that it's you know what in a sense, it is not right because it's it's not what we're made to be doing. It's not for us to be judgeful. It's not for us to be disrespectful to people. It's just for to love each other. Whether you're hurting, whether you're you're black, you're white, you're Asian, you're whatever the case may be, yeah. and that's what we were made to do is just to have pure love for each other. Yeah, it's not right to experience a life that's outside yeah. of our design. And, and the one thing I was and I was telling her is that I, and I don't know if feeling sorry for him was the right thing to do, but it. In my opinion, in this situation I was in, it, it actually helped me to not be judgeful. Yeah. Because I, like there was a, uh, um, you said a while ago, it's you see a child hurting in the corner. If you see that person hurting in the corner, it's less likely that you're going to be like, well, why are you crying? Like, you feel sorry for them in a sense where you want to love them. You want to yeah. care for them. You want to hold them. You want to make them feel special. So it's like, how do you do that when it's a grown man? <laughs> that's 25 years old and you're just like 
how do you, I, 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 don't, I don't really know if there's a way you can, because then you get into where you're laboring and toiling for that person. But. No, if it's born from compassion, it's not laboring and toiling. If you haven't taken on the burden. If, it's, if compassion is the father of what you're doing, that's not laboring and toiling, right? If you say, I'm going to bring salvation to this guy at all costs, now right. you're laboring and toiling. Right. Right. If you're just living out of compassion and union with God, mm -hmm. then that's not laboring and toiling. But I'm going to challenge a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, I know this is popular in the world, but the idea that we become who we hang around with, that idea doesn't come from God. Because God came into the earth, and he was surrounded by sinners, and he never became a sinner. Okay? Now, in some instances, that can be true. If a person is not established in the grace of God, yes. then they can be heavily influenced by the, the people around them. But if I'm talking about you in this specific situation, you're filled with the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't a danger that you're going to become like this guy. No. Right? Exactly. Because your life is like shielded from that. Mm -hmm. Right? Because your heart is established in the Spirit of the living God. Mm -hmm. So he can't make you become like anything. Right, right. Now, as far as what do I do, um, I, I often have questions like that. And it's, I could give you a bunch of different answers, but then it becomes like formulaic. Mm -hmm. And I don't find that you can apply a formula to an individual. Oh, yeah, definitely not. And so what it becomes is like uh, um, being led by the Spirit in each situation. Each situation can look different. And so what I would say to you is, you felt compassion for the guy. That would be an indication to me of a conversation you and God are already having. Right? Mm -hmm. Like you feel a desire for this guy to be free. And, and I think you, you, you and God have that same desire simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so what I would encourage you now is to talk to God about this guy. And lay it out on the line how you feel about his life and how um, you see that he's suffering. And that, yeah. man, you desire for him to be free from this. And then I would commit that desire unto God and tell God, you're available for whatever may, or can, may help him or may speak to him, even if it takes 10 years down the road for it to actually hit his heart. I'm available for you to speak out of me. I'm available for you to love this guy out of me. I'm available for you to bring forth words out of me that can help this guy. And then just be led by that. And then not judge yourself. Right. right? If you feel led in your heart to do something and you do it, do not walk away judging yourself or judging the outcome. Mm -hmm. You want to, that's it. And if you feel yourself analyzing it, right. tell God. You're Commit saying, it into God's hands. Are you saying like, say if I were to write him something and then obviously it didn't go the way I would like it to go, yeah. don't judge that. That's right. Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. don't judge it as negative. Okay. Don't judge the outcome. It might take him 20 years. It, it, right. Something you say today, it may take him a lifetime for it to hit him. A seed is sown. Paul talked about how some plant, some water, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so don't underestimate the power of something you said, even if he doesn't get it. And just be led by God. You know, I would be led differently in every situation. Um, a lot of times, there, there are times where I would confront the guy if I felt loved by the Spirit. And not confront the guy like, what's wrong with you? But, you know, not like that. Because then what you're doing is you're immediately putting them in a self-justification mode. Where they're going to fight. They're already filled with self-justification. That's why they're racist. And so now, the moment you come like that, he's going to want to fight. Right? And so that's not going to get anywhere. That's just going to make him dig in. And so I would be led by the Spirit, and I would just talk about questions. I would just talk, you know, ask questions. Have you considered, if you feel to, thoughts? You, you put questions instead of attacks, yes. right? I know you insert yourself. I know in my own life, I remember blah, 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 blah. And see how you're talking about yourself? And now he can look upon you from the outside in and not look at it as a direct attack right. against him. Mm -hmm. Right? D does that make sense? That, that can be yeah. really um, effective. Now, if I was with the guy and he was actively engaging in some injustice oh, well, yeah. against another well, person, never happened, but... all right, if, yeah. if that was the case, then absolutely I'd be like, listen, man, this isn't the life of God. Yeah. This isn't the life God has for you. Yeah. I know this hatred that you feel. I know it don't make you feel good. Yeah. I know that it's got you all rent and angry on the inside, man. I can yeah. tell. Right? There was a couple times where he said something, and I'm like, come on, man, you, you can't say stuff like that. That's, that's not right. He's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I, I can't say stuff like that around you guys. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, and so pose a question and ask God about the question. Yeah. Pose a question. Like I, People say things to me all the time that they are so certain is the truth. That, and I'll just say, man, have you considered whether or not God's the one who told you that? Did God come down and tell you that? No. Has God told you that? 
You know, have you considered that the Bible says there's no more Jew or Gentile? Are you, have you considered that God doesn't know anybody after the flesh? Yeah, it's just, yeah, that was one thing I struggled with. I wasn't trying to convince him in that short time span. I mean, I don't even know if I'll ever run into this guy again. I mean, I only really communicate now just on random and stuff, but, but that was definitely something that I'm sure not myself, I'm sure others, people have experienced. And just how do you approach that situation? And again, like you just said, just with, with God's love and obviously discuss that with God before you go do it yourself. Led by the Spirit. Now, if I'm with a guy and he's, like I said, if he's persecuting a person because of the race and I'm there, I'm going to say something to him. Right. Right? I'm not going to call him, I'm not going to say all these horrible things about him as a person, no. but I'm going to start talking about how that's not the life of God. Right. And I'm going to start talking about the way God sees that person. I'm going to talk about the way, how, what God has done with that person's life. And I'm going to start talking about the, do you see what I'm saying? Right. I'm going to start attacking the wisdom that's dwelling in this guy that's bringing that out. Right. I'm going to attack the wisdom, not the guy. Right. Right. So that he can, it's this wisdom that's doing it to him. I guarantee you at the end of the night, yeah. when he's alone in the corner, he don't feel good about it. Because he was a good guy. I mean, he, he loved his wife. He has a kid. Like you can tell that he has love in his heart mm -hmm. for the love that he shares for his wife and his, and his kid. Yeah. It's just, when I hear him say that stuff, I'm like, Dude, you're like two different people. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it can be shocking. Mm -hmm. It can be shocking. But th th these people, they already have this thing that's in them that isn't from God. It's already warring against their soul. Right? right? It's not like we, th we think they go home and throw themselves a party in their room <laughs> at night. And they rejoice in it. Right. That's I'm, just, I'm serious. That's the image we've created of the people we say are doing evil. Yeah. But we'll take the greatest example in the history of human beings. Herod. I mean, we, we, we get up in arms about a guy who kills 30 people today, and we call him a serial killer, and we say he has no conscience. Mm -hmm. Okay? How many babies do you think Herod had killed? Babies. Babies. Right. babies. How many do you think Herod had killed? Well, we all have this image of Herod as if he's off in the corner at night rejoicing, dancing around naked. Look what I've done. Ra ra re, Kick him in the knee. Ra ra. You know? You guys know the chant? That's what we think of. Okay. Well, when the angel showed up in the room, why didn't Herod stand up? full of pride and confidence at all the babies he had killed. Why was he filled with fear? If he was busy thinking what he'd done was good or the right way. Right. Do, do you see what I'm saying? And so what we, we want to recognize is even when evil fruit is manifesting in a person's life or a fruit that's born from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that fruit is warring against their soul even if they don't act like it or admit it openly. It's already warring against their soul. It's depriving them of peace and love and joy. And so you can speak to that, right? You can speak to that also because you're going to it's going to connect with them. They're going to know. Right? And then they'll go off. And a lot of the power will be in them going off and having a conversation with God. Right? And if he esteems you, he's going to consider what you think and he's going to consider what you say, even if he doesn't acknowledge it right off the bat. He's going to walk away thinking about it. Right? Right? Yeah, I guess I guess how do you how would you word or how would you attack the thoughts then and not per se attack him? I guess how would you word that or how would you – how is that – how are you attacking the thoughts more than attacking that person? The way I would attack the thoughts is just like I said. I would talk about the value of the person that he's busy saying has less value. I would start talking about what God has said about human. I would start talking about how God feels about all human beings. I would start just looking at it from that perspective, what God would say about that person, right? right. And I, I would just go at it from that perspective, right? Jesus died for that guy because God determined that guy's life was as valuable as his own, mm -hmm. right? And so I would just yeah. start confessing the truth, and that will have power on many folds. It will speak to the person who's experiencing the injustice, It'll protect their heart, and it will contradict this wisdom that's tried to destroy this other guy's life. Because it's not like the wisdom comes along to be the racist friend. The wisdom comes along to destroy the racist also. Right? right. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not like the racist is, racist is getting something good from his thinking. He's getting pain and suffering. Right? right? And he's going to pass that on to his son. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 But the very fact you went with him and you were together with him, that's walking with him, you know, I think that spoke a lot, and the yeah. words you spoke to him probably already are, are resting back there and just coming up for yeah. And even if he says, oh, you're the God, man, Bob, don't yeah, be deterred don't by that. Yeah. yeah, don't make any judgments about but that. I didn't, but it was like, I was just, like, I'm not even trying to do that, you know, I don't want, I'm not even trying to like, 
you need to go listen to God. Like I wasn't even trying to do that. I just like made some, hey, I think it was just, I made some comment about how beautiful the day was. And I'm like, man, I love how God just created all this stuff. It's just gorgeous day. It's beautiful, the sun. And he's like, oh man, here they got again. I'm like, what? I'm not even trying to do anything like that. <laughs> Right. And offense doesn't mean don't get angry. Yeah. Right. That's one aspect. Offense would be don't make any conclusions based on his statement. Yeah. Don't judge the thoughts and intents of his heart mm-hmm. based on what he said because you have no idea what's going on in his heart. Yeah, and so true. if you walk away and say, oh, well, because he said that, I'll never say anything ever again, yeah. you, you're offended. Mm-hmm. True. Right? Yeah. You've now taken a conclusion from what he said mm-hmm. instead of just living by the passion in your heart. Yeah. Right? Plenty of people don't want to hear what I have to say. Just tell him you are too. You just yeah. don't know how much God loves you. That is a very real force though. Because I mean, there are times where I feel like, what's the point of saying? I've had conversations with God where I thought, Lord, what's the point of saying any of this stuff? <laughs> what's the point? All of us that have, yes. Well, obviously that's an unrighteous thought I'm having. Right. But I mean, sometimes you get frustrated. You, you never notice the ones that are like, you know... Hit, hit, yeah, man. Yeah, you right. never notice that. You always notice like the million that are like, "What is that guy talking about? What's wrong with him? Why don't he just shut up?" You know. And so then you, 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 you it, it can happen where you feel like, "What's the point of saying anything?" And I just thank God that Jesus didn't say that. What's the point, Lord? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, even whenever he would go, I would, and he would say, like, what's the point of even going? That's what I would say. You just still go. You're still, you're still just being there. Yeah. You yeah. Know? You're the God kind. God's in you. Mm-hmm. Right? There's value in wherever you go. Value can be born in any situation. The knowledge of good and evil, though, wants you to live by what you would say would be a good outcome and a, a bad outcome. And then it wants you to judge yourself by what you would say is a good outcome and a bad outcome. Because we would all say a better outcome would have been if you would have said, yeah, isn't it nice? <laughs> and then we would have felt real happy. Right, but right. he didn't say that. And so yeah. we're like, oh. oh right? See, yeah. God wants to free you from that. Mm-hmm. Where you don't live by what you think you see as the result. You right. just live by the passion. And so your passion was to say that. And then you would just be happy because that was your passion. Period. Right. Instead of looking around, well, how did I go over with that guy? <laughs> what did that guy think? And right. listen, I'm the king center of all of that. Because when you say something, man, it's nice to get a positive response. Yeah. Especially if the only reason why you say it is because you're busy loving the people. Right. right. And so it's easy to fall into the trap where, man, if you don't think you saw the right outcome or result, you judge yourself as evil. Yeah. Why did I say that? I don't want to say that anymore. You know? <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then that will steal your strength. That's not freedom. Right, that's not freedom. That's bondage. Mm-hmm. There's also the point where, you know, sometimes you just kind of move on. I don't know, if it, like it says in the Bible, like, just, what did you say? What did you say? That, that, Kick the dust off your feet off your and feet. move on. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's like the, Jesus tell the disciples, listen, if you, they don't, if you come to people and you tell them the truth and they don't receive you into your house, don't the, kick the dust off your feet. Is don't take the burden onto yourself. Don't take all this frustration onto yourself. Just move on. Just move on. And so that's also very real, right? If you don't feel a desire to walk with the guy, don't feel like I'm supposed to walk with the guy. Right. If you feel like you, you, you shared... Um, you're, you're also free to kick the dust off your feet. And that's why we say be led by the Spirit and not a formula. Yeah. Because the moment we start talking about how we could do it, people are going to say that's how I should do it. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, and then right. they want to whip out their, their notepad and follow the instructions. <laughs> and human beings, one of the, worst, the hardest things for us is actually just be led by the Spirit and the desire in our heart. We, we so badly want somebody just to come and tell us how to do it. And then, okay, I'll do that. Right? Yeah. Right. Like the, the Israelites said to Moses, I don't know, we don't want to hear God. You go talk to God and you come back and tell us. <laughs> right? That's not yeah. my responsibility. Right. Yeah. See, but the Holy Spirit can discern the thoughts and intents of a person's heart. The Holy Spirit can discern the foundation that is bringing this in, alive in someone's life. And, the, and that, that's different in everybody's situation. And so you never know what's going to jar. You, you could be led to talk about something that ain't got nothing to do with the actual thing. And that could set him free. And you don't even realize it. You might just start talking about fishing one day. And maybe he was off fishing with his grandfather one day when this whole thing got implemented in him. And he'll go back and remember that day and all of a sudden see, oh. Yeah. Right? I mean, you, you never know. Yeah. I hope that makes some sense. All that. So, you know, listen, when I talk about these things, people walk away thinking Greg's a racist. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's crazy, man. 
it, it, it's, it, but it, we, when, we, when we think about the wisdom, when we think about things from the wisdom of the world, that's the only conclusion we can come to. We don't actually hear what's being said, right? We have our own filter and we filter through it. So listen, feel free, like Jay so beautifully pointed out, to kick the dust off your feet if, and walk on if you feel led to do that. Don't feel like um, you have some great commission where you must, right. you know, don't take the burden of changing the person. Um, feel free to be led by the Spirit, right? Mm-hmm. And the Spirit will give you boldness to, to speak. And you can ask God, give me boldness to say what you would say and how you would say it in all these situations. And after it comes out of me, man, be there with me to wash my conscience came from judging myself. Hallelujah. That's been my prayer to God. You know, for so long, people think, well, if I... If I tell Greg that the message was good, then he'll like the message. Listen, there isn't a thing in the world anybody could tell me to convince me the message was good. Because it ain't about what other people think. It's about myself. I mean, listen, guys. I was telling Bobby, that's why I was such a great athlete. I have this perfectionism in me that I judge myself. It doesn't matter what other people think. I sit with the judgment where I judged every single thing I say or do to see if it was good or evil. Right? It's like I went and picked up the donuts this morning, I was telling everybody. I just go to pick up the donuts. Well, two dozen of the donuts are not the, the, in the manner that I ordered them in. <laughs> and listen, all of a sudden, I didn't have to stop and think. or All of a sudden, I felt this great pressing within and without that the donuts are perfect. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> all the people are going to die. How can we have peace and love and joy when we don't have the assortment of donuts that we need? Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. See, see what I realize is that, same, that wisdom isn't just something I apply with the donuts. That's something that got put in me when I was young and that I judge everything by. And even I judge my preaching by that. Right? So I could have said something that's beautiful, but if I don't think I said every single thing that ever could be said about a topic or a matter in every single way that it could be said, then I blew it. And it wasn't perfect. And now how can we have peace and love and joy? <laughs> Do you see how that works? And so the prayer isn't that I can believe that it's good. That's not the prayer. The prayer that I can, is that I can walk away and not consider even if it was good. That's innocence, right? Paul, not, Paul said he did not even judge himself. Yes. Yeah, I don't need to judge myself. Yes, and that's where the faith will get you. Where you don't walk away judging yourself or what you've done is good or evil. Right? You'll just walk away free. You won't even consider whether it was good or evil. That, that's the freedom of the gospel. That's my prayer to God. Father, I don't, you know, listen, that doesn't mean it's bad when people tell you that it's good. You can feel greatly encouraged that they're experiencing life. You can be happy. Paul said, listen, I didn't desire a gift, but I desire that uh, a treasure would be accounted to your account. He's des- he desired to see the fruit of the Spirit born in a person. So if a person is like, oh, man, I feel the love of God. That was so good. Man, you can enjoy that. But at the end of the day, freedom will be where you don't judge yourself by whether or not people enjoy it, whether or not people like it, whether or not you think it was perfect or not. Right? And that's my prayer to God. Father, I want to walk away and not even have my mind twisting on, oh, I didn't say that, though. Oh, I, didn't, I missed this part of it. Oh, I did Oh, man. Next thing you know, you're like, oh, wretched man that I am. Why do I even talk? That's right. <laughs> do you see what it'll do to you? But if you can walk away and say, I said what I said. It is what it is. I am that I am. <laughs> bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye yeah. now. <laughs> Then you can actually enjoy what was said. You can go back and listen to it and be like, man, God is good. Right? And the same thing goes for, as far as freedom. You can have the freedom when what the other person said or didn't say, you know, you don't judge that. That's right. You know, you're, you're, you're having a conversation with someone else and you think that what they said back to you wasn't good or they should have said this or they should have done that. That's not freedom either. That's not. Yeah. And especially in ministry, like freedom for me was appreciating the, the aspect of the heart of God that comes out of any minister instead of criticizing the aspects that don't come out right. or the parts that they missed or didn't exactly use the perfect terminology. Listen, that ain't God scrutinizing that thing. Do you know what I'm saying? 
Now, I'm not talking about whether they speak in pure law or whatever, but I'm saying there's a lot of preachers out there that their heart is full of grace and their terminology is catching up with what they know in their heart, right? And it, it isn't the grace of God to sit around and pick them apart, <laughs> right? It isn't the grace of God to sit around and find all the faults in their explanations, right? The grace of God would allow you to just em- embrace the heart that they have, right? And love the, the God that does come out of them, right? Amen. And then you can walk with them. One of my mottos that I always say is, who cares? And at the end of the day, it's not that I don't care about other people and their judgments. It's more of, there's only one I have to answer to, and there's only one that I'm accountable for. And I know he doesn't care. Yeah. And so that's what I always just say. Who cares? Who cares if the donuts are wrong? Who ca- I mean, like, yeah. nobody really does at the end of the day. And even if they are, who cares? That's nobody right. Nobody knows that the donuts were wrong. Yeah. No, I told everybody now, though. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. No, like, listen. The- morning and <laughs> Listen, it happens quicker and quicker. I, I just, I'm counting the donuts. I was looking at the donuts in the car, and, and as I'm pulling out the thing, I'm like, oh, man, I'm starting to feel that pressing within and out. And, out. and I'm, I just hear God say, Craig, do you really think it matters if the donuts aren't the assortment that you picked? <laughs> like, no, listen. No. Everybody probably was going to think this. These donuts are great. Oh, they're going to be amazing. But, but because you said that, yeah, yeah. Now I'm corrupting. I'm corrupting the conscience. <laughs> <laughs> now you'll feel the lack. <laughs> I feel great relief that you said that because I'm doing that all day long about the things I say, I don't say, or I mean, all the judgments. Yeah. And it's great to hear. I mean, I don't ever want you to suffer. But it's so great to hear that others are going through yeah, yeah. the same thing you're going through. And yeah. who cares after all? Yeah. So thank you for suffering. saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but it's funny the things we get wrapped up into. But I was telling Bobby, as an athlete, it was perfectionism. Right? I mean, I would go outside and shoot baskets for like five hours at night and if I didn't hit a hundred shots in a row all in the same manner forget about if they went in they had to go in in the same manner it, they, it had to make the same sound if the net didn't pop the same I had to start back over at zero wow. it's a good attitude for basketball now listen that worked out real well for being the greatest shooter that you know youth league had ever seen I averaged like 44 points a game but listen that tore me up on the inside mm-hmm. You know, the running thing, you're trying to shave seconds, microseconds. You're trying to perfect every little tiny thing. Listen, that's not good for experiencing peace in the world. It might be good for your one athletic event, but it's going to lead to a life of turmoil it your joy. after that. Absolutely. Right? You can't just enjoy the game. No, you don't. No. You don't. And it's the weirdest thing now where I'm so laid back that now in, in some of those areas, like my friend that I played basketball with, he came over last night. And I was telling him, I was like, man, it's amazing how I just don't even care about that stuff anymore. He couldn't recall because he was on all my teams. And when we were 10 years old, man, it was like life or death for me out there on the court. And like I would be up in people's grills. You got to cut him off at the baseline, man. You can't just, you know, it's like <laughs> life or death for me in that thing, man. We were like playing. It's like as if the world could have been saved if we won. You know, we were 10 years old. <laughs> Me four guys, man. I look the same way I apologize to I my siblings. <laughs> Michelle experienced all of that, man. And the same way I apologize to all my siblings. I, from time to time, I do apologize, you know, to some of my friends. <laughs> Because everything was so serious, you know? Life or death is found in the donut assortment. (laughs) Uh, But think of a thing that you think life and death is found of. Don't just think, oh, that's happened to Greg, because that's something that happens to all of us. Think of a thing that's kind of corrupted your conscience, that upsets you if it don't go exactly right. And realize, just for a moment, the, the brevity of what you're actually saying. You're actually saying life and death is found in this thing. Then realize how ridiculous that sounds. Not that you're ridiculous, but how ridiculous that wisdom sounds. Mm -hmm. And then start letting freedom set you free from that, right? Ladies, cooking, you know? We just had Thanksgiving. A lot of times I know the ladies got to feel this pressure, you know, to get the food out, to get it perfect, to have everything there for everybody to be happy. And it can become like life and death is found in that thing, right? And it's much better for you to be set free from that, right? And just, man, I love my family. I'm doing this from a foundation of joy. That's where it all began. And it will be what it will be. Glory to God. Right. I think one of the things you have to be careful of, at least for me personally, is that when I trip on something like that, commit it to God, yeah. if you don't hear something back right away, then you go, well, why not? 
just to know that God is, has heard you and is working on it in your, on your behalf. Yeah. And it may, he may not respond right away. He may not respond you know, in, your, in a period of time that you're cognizant of. But don't judge yourself because you don't hear anything bad or feel anything or sense the Spirit leading you one way or another because I fall into that trap all the time. Yeah, and if I'm hearing you right, and correct me if I'm not, what, what you're saying is, is that, that God does hear you and is answering, but you don't always see it right yes, away. Exactly. You don't know yeah. what needs to be sorted out. You don't know that he's, what he's doing on right. the scene. If you're waiting for like some audible voice, and if you don't think you get an audible voice, you judge that <clears> to mean <throat> he didn't hear, right. that's an unrighteous conclusion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Jesus said, he does not abhor the affliction of the afflicted one, neither does he hide his face from him, but he hears when he cries yes. unto him. Right? So we have a confident expectation that in our, in our affliction or wherever we're at, God hears us and he's working it out. Yeah. Right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Great point. Glory to God. That's Glory it. To God. All right. I sure hope you got my favorite donut. <laughs> <laughs>